everyone, my name is Christine. Come along with me as I show you how I cut triangles using different rulers, how I sew the triangles together, as well as quilting on my sewing machine. Here we go. After I have my fabrics ironed, I want to cut st strips. You can do whatever size final triangle you want. I am doing five inches. I'm going to show you several tools you can use for cutting your triangles. We are making equilateral triangles. I have some tools that I always use, but I also want to show you other tools that can be used. So in order to make equilateral triangles, we need something with a 60 degree line on it. I have also bought some rulers that also give me um, the 60 degree angle for being able to make the equilateral triangles. One of them is this uh, 60 degree diamond ruler from Creative Grids, which that one's really cool. They give lots of great patterns on that one. I'm not sponsored or anything. These are just what I have on hand. This was the very first one I had used. It is the rhombus template from the Missouri Star. And if you see on here, it says, use this side for triangles. But what I love about this and this 60 degree ruler is the ends are cut off already for you. If you happen to have this template, the first thing you're going to do is right here. It says line up edge of fabric strip here to cut triangles. So this is why when I first started creating this pattern, this is the only thing I had for making triangles. It's what worked for my mind that made sense. And so you'll see that right here, this blunt edge goes right up against the edge of this fabric. So this is why I cut them at five inches. I'm lining that up on the bottom. This lines up up here. I'm going as far over this way as possible. But what's nice with it being clear, I can still kind of see that I'm getting some of these cute ice skates in here. So before I lift this, I am cutting off these little tiny bits here. It's an equilateral triangle, so it's the same distance on all sides. If I am continuing on, I will just take my ruler and turn it this way and continue on cutting. The Creative Grid 60 degree ruler is basically the same way. It has a line here, it's actually asterisks. The thing with this one is that in order to cut off my points, I just take my ruler and line it up. Now, if you have a long ruler like this that has the 30 degree, 45 degree, or 60 degree line on it, if you're using this one, you want to line up your five inch strip with the lines on your mat. So what I wanna do is take the 60 degree line, going this way, and that is going to go on the bottom of my strip. So again, the 60 degree line going this way is on the line on my mat and running along the bottom of my fabric. So the videos that you just watched, I made those last night. And I was thinking about it overnight and I wanted to make sure that I am explaining myself properly because for me doing these triangles, it's very intimidating. I don't know why, it just it just is. And I thought if other people out there are like that and you just have a ruler that has a 60 degree line on it, I wanna make sure that you feel confident in doing your cutting because fabric is expensive and your time is precious. So these rulers, they are designed to include the measurement to where the tips are cut off. All that does is make it so that that seam, when those 
fabrics come together aren't as bulky. Just got out a scrap piece of fabric. And I recommend doing this before you cut into your really nice fabrics into where you're getting comfortable cutting if you're doing it in this manner with the 60 degree line on your ruler. And I cut it at four and a half inches. I also wanted to show that you can do whatever width you want as long as you are consistent. Always remember whenever you're cutting, whether it's squares or triangles or anything, you want to use the same ruler for all of it to be consistent. So for your first cut, I am taking the 60 degree line on my ruler and I'm putting it along the long edge here to get my first cut. And so with this method where you're using the 60 degree line on a ruler, this does not take into account the points being cut off. So you could put the 60 degree line on the side that you just cut. What I like to do is I like to use still the line on my mat. It just, it just works for me and my, my mind that I am lining, lining it up on the mat as well as the edge of the fabric. If it moves around, just line up that line on the edge of your fabric here. It's not the longest line of the fabric because this distance is the same as this distance. It really doesn't matter if you line it up here and go down or here and go up. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you if I line the 60 degree line up on the cut edge and I'm looking to get to that point. You're just picking a side to line the 60 degree line up on. Here's one of the other reasons why I suggest trying with a scrap piece of fabric and cutting until you feel comfortable. Because here is the ultimate way to know if you are doing these correctly. Like I said, equilateral triangles are the same distance on all sides. So if I take this, this is how they were cut, I can put this right here. It's the same. If I turn it, it's the same. If I turn it again, it's the same. So that way you know that they are all the same. Again, I'm gonna reiterate again. The main thing is that all of your triangles are cut with the same ruler and cut in the exact same manner all the way through for whatever project you're working on. And when it comes to having them points cut off, that also is not imperative. So in the rest of this video, you're going to see the triangles as I'm sewing them together and all of mine have their points cut off. So when you are going to sew them together, you just line your points up. You match them up and then just sew your quarter of an inch down. Okay, so for this first triangle table runner, I have cut 26 triangles and there are going to be two rows of triangles. This first table runner is going to have the triangles in the center and then we are going to do a small inner border and an outer border. Later in the video, I will show you how to make more of a wide triangle table runner, which will not have any borders on it. Okay, I finally have the layout that I like. I recommend that when you are laying out your fabrics that you look at it uh, through the lens of your camera. I find that it does help to take a picture because sometimes you're looking at it and you're like I think it looks okay but it just seems off but when you look at it through a camera it just it looks completely different so now coming to sewing so this is how I do my triangles is that I will sew this whole row together and this whole row together so I go through with pins and I pin them together Trust me on this. It is very easy to get them mixed up. I highly recommend 
going through and doing the one row and putting a pin in it. Okay, open it back up and how it went that you're familiar with and then do this next one. And pin that. Another way that you can sew this together if you like is you could do it in sections. You could do just that section and then this section. So still do the pinning like I said. So you would go along here, pin, open up, add that one, pin. Trust me on this. I've made a bunch of these. You'll want a pin. But say you don't have as much fabric or you don't want one this long. So you have an end table or a short coffee table. You just want it shorter. You just do however many you want. So say this was the length, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on each side, so 14. You know, you could definitely just do a small one. If you have a really long table, just keep adding. What is beautiful about this particular one is when you're done, it leaves this point on the end, which I just think looks so cool. There was one more thing that I wanted to point out. So I like to make sure that I don't get my rows turned around. So I use scratch pieces of paper for, and then I have numbers written on them. I like to just label this as row one. So I know that this is this side. And then this is row two. Now I also have um, arrows on here. I use that for ironing. I would iron all my seams that way. All my odd numbers go that way. All my even numbers go that way. So I don't have to try to remember it, but I do recommend doing either a number like this or even just putting, you know, when you're only dealing with two rows, you could just put one pin here and then put two pins in over here. When I pin them, I'm not lining up my ends or anything like that. I'm just pinning them to make sure I sew on the correct side. So I wanted to talk to you about starting in a bit on the machine instead of starting right here and hoping it doesn't go down into the feed dogs. Even though my points are cut off, there's still always that chance. So until I get the first section going, because I will just keep chain piecing. Okay, so normally you would just start here and just sew, okay? What I like to do is I am going in onto the fabric right here. So I'm, my needle is starting on the fabric. I'm gonna take a few stitches, okay? And then now I will do some back stitching to get back to the beginning, basically. And then sometimes I'll grab this tail thread to prevent it from getting tucked down in there. But typically it does help so it doesn't start doing, you know, getting pulled down into the feed dogs there. And you see, I am just lining up my cutoff points, if you have points, they will also line up. And then I have painter's tape on my machine. The green edge lines up with my quarter inch and the blue is my needle. Okay, so this just kind of helps me keep things straight as I'm going up until I get up there. Oh, here's one more thing is if you do have this number here, make sure you don't have a pin underneath there somewhere because that would be bad. Once I get to that end, since I am just dealing with two rows, I'm just cutting off that first row. And then I will just find anywhere on here. I don't have to do the one right next to it. I can, but I can basically pick anywhere there's a pin and sew it down. I'm just going to continue on because they're all pinned. I don't have to worry about them getting all mixed up or anything. The pin is telling me it's okay. When it comes to where you have your seams together, so you have a seam here, 
and then the seam here. I just finger press to the dark side on that one. And on this one, it's gonna be my green as well. So I'm just finger pressing that open. So you'll see when I do that, it leaves that nice straight edge there. So I'm just take my pin out. And so I can line up this edge, but I'm not worried about the end edge yet. I'm worried about up here first. So I am just lining this up first. So I'm folding it towards the green. You can fold it towards the other side, it doesn't matter. But for me, I'm just folding to the darker of the two fabrics. And then I will get it under the machine and start stitching to hold it. So again, I'm just folding towards the darker side. You see it still leaves that corner like that. And so this just lays right on top there. So you see, it looks like it's kind of baggy up here because I'm dealing with the bias. You may have some stretch. You're trying not to do it, but it's going to happen. So I am more concerned about this edge down here than I am this. So I get this lined up where I want it. I am holding it with my finger. And then I'm just gonna let the sewing machine do the rest of the work. I wanna discuss ironing when dealing with the triangles because you are dealing with the bias, which is super stretchy. I don't wanna take my iron and just kinda do this because that's really gonna get it all distorted so I just kind of go along and lay it flat. And I'm, like I said, I'm not too worried about which way the seams are going. Would it be nice if they all went the same way? Yeah. But I really don't worry too much about it because when I sew the other row to it, I may need to turn it. And so then I'll just straighten them out at the end. But basically when ironing, I'm just kind of going along with my fingers, making sure that it is laying flat back there. Just putting the iron over the seam. I'm not using the iron to push the seam open. I am using my fingers to make sure it's laying nice and flat, but I am not using the iron to push that seam open. I'm using my hands ahead of time. And it's kind of like finger pressing. Now you could certainly go along and just iron all your seams one way and all your seams the other way on the other one. That's totally cool too. All in all, don't make it too complicated. Don't stress out about it. It's just fabric. Sometimes it's just gonna do what it wants it to do. And if you know, you can make it do what you want to do as well. It doesn't matter what the inside of your project looks like. All that matters is the top. So, now this is where it comes in really handy that I did my number. So I know this is row one, okay? And let's see, this is row two and it goes on this side. So if something happened and you didn't mark it, Hopefully you took a picture of it beforehand. It really can't be another way. I certainly couldn't do it this way. I would know right away. But if you're doing a project that has a lot more rows, you know, like you're making a quilt top, then you'll want to make sure that that is laid out like that. And if you were making a quilt top, you could have half triangles to fill in these, these sides. I don't know, maybe you wanna have a, a jagged edge. You could do that. You can leave it whole and then just go along and then just trim these bits off to make it straight. If you were making, you know, a quilt, like a large quilt or a baby quilt. My main thing is that when I am sewing, I don't wanna lose my points. 
So as I'm sewing, I'm going to make sure that my needle goes that way of the point so I don't lose my points. And all in all, if I did catch into the point a little bit, a, no big deal. We are not looking for perfection here. We are looking for a beautiful project. That's the way I look at things. Of course, I strive to be as perfect as possible, to make things as easy as possible and as beautiful as possible. But I don't want it to be stressful or discouraging either. So I finally have gotten to a point in my quilting journey that I know I am always doing the best that I can. I iron my seam and any, my, my middle seam, and any seams on the back that are just not sure which way they wanna go, I'm going to assist them. I always use um, high heat and I always use steam. And now for the middle seam, I do iron that one open because this type of table runner, I quilted on my regular sewing machine. And so if I can eliminate some of that bulk, I do that. And I just kind of pull it a little bit. I'm not stretching it. I'm just kind of pulling it. Stick my finger in that seam. and start getting it going. So after this part, after I have it good and ironed, I'm gonna cut white and it has little gold flakes in it. I'm gonna use that for the inner border. And I'm just gonna do that one, and I'm gonna cut it at one and a half inches so it finishes at one inch. I'm gonna cut this at two and a half inches. So inner border cut at one and a half inches outer border cut at two and a half inches okay i have my one and a half inch inner border sewn to both sides of the length of the runner this runner is about 36 and a half inches long by nine and a quarter inches wide Okay, so my table runner finishes at about 15 and a quarter by 43 and a half, I think. So I need to get batting and backing for it. So I'm gonna show you my fabric cord. <laughs> no, actually this is the closet under the, under the stairs. So I wanted to show you how I keep just a, it's like a shower curtain rod, some sort of, you know, the spring rod in here. And what I do is I keep the hangers like off of pants or shorts that you get at the store. Okay, so I put you on my little tripod so I'm not shaking you around. Anyway, um, let's see, I need at least probably 16 inches by 45 inches. So whenever I'm done with a quilt and you trim up your batting and backing, I go through when I'm all done and I measure what that finished, you know, what the, the remnant is. And then I do on a scrap piece of paper and I pin what that measurement is. So when it comes to like making a table runner or table topper, I can just come in here and look for the size I need. That way I don't have to cut it. It's already done. It's repurposed. So let's see. Um, also, uh, I buy batting by the ginormous roll. So I get... Um, it's an all natural cotton batting with scrim and I get a white and I get a cream color. So since that table runner is more cream, I'm, I'm going to keep with that cream color. So 16 by 54. So I do try to put them in numerical order if I can. So right here, here's an 18 by 8. And it just speeds up the process, you know, because you know, once you get towards the end of a project, you're like, Okay, I just need to be done.
Okay, I'm gonna do um, a bonus layout here. It's basically how I did it before, but this one I call um, a wide triangle table runner. I cut 48 of my equilateral triangles. It's gonna be four rows going across, but the outside rows are gonna be shorter. The outside row will have 11 and then 13 and then 13 again and 11. So you could do this with just 40 triangles and do 9, 11, 11, 9. Um, you know, of course you can, of course do whatever you want, it's your project. I'm gonna put this together just like the other one. I'm gonna mark my, my rows first and then go back and pin them all together and, and assemble it just like the one with two rows. You could quilt it however you like. I'll just show you a couple examples that I do. And then I will also put some pictures of other triangle projects I've done. So different styles of table runners for different holidays. I've done this in a baby quilt. So I'll show a picture of that. So now it comes to stitching, uh, quilt stitching on my machine. You can hand quilt these, you can stitch them on your domestic, you can do them on a long arm if you have a long arm. So, but on today I am going to do echo quilting with this wide table topper. And then the other one, I'm gonna do a wavy line stitching. So when it comes to thread color, I err, I like to do um, lighter threads in my quilt stitching. So I'll lay them lay them out to see which one speaks to me. If I can go a little bit darker, I will do that. And so this one, it seems like this, uh, like a, it's a khaki color or something. Um, but when it's, when it is spread out, it seems to lighten up. And I like the look of this one. I'm going to use this lighter one on this one. When it comes to upper thread and bobbin thread, I always leave them the same. So I don't have to worry about if tensions get off that, you know, you would have that little dot showing, you know, on the lighter thread with if there's a darker thread on the other side. I do like to wear a glove on one hand to help kind of push it through and give me some, you know, stickiness, if you will. I have one of those copper gloves that I'll wear. Um, but I've also done where you can buy these inexpensive mittens at the store and typically I'll like cut like one of the fingers off. Also put a walking foot on my machine to help those bottom feed dogs be consistent with the, with the walking foot, you know, pushing that through to keep that consistency so it doesn't get bogged down. If it slows down, then your stitches will be smaller. So this just helps keep your stitches consistent. It's not imperative, but if you can get a walking foot for your machine, I highly recommend it. I do a regular, just a 2.5 stitch length when I am quilting on my sewing machines. Okay, so I'm ready to start my stitching and you can see that the kind of walking foot that I have, the foot is really wide. So when the needle would go down, it would be all the way over here. And that is a little bit too far over for my liking so i am going to move my stitch or my needle over as far as it'll go to the left and so because what i'm doing is i am lining up this edge with the edge of the fabric and i am going to do that throughout the whole project and it will always be on the left side i'm going to go all the way down one side and then up the other. Another thing, as I am moving along, even though I have it pinned, um, I still like, as I am quilting it, I still like to, you know, whenever I stop, I kind of smooth. And I'm smoothing down and out to make sure that, you know, there's not going to be any puckers on the bottom. Before I become, come to a pin, when I am still a ways away, I like to go ahead and pull that out.
Okay, and you can see as I'm going through, see how this is getting a bit of a gather. It just, it just happens. I don't care how much I smooth it out when I'm pinning it or if I do spray basting, it just seems to, to happen. So you just know it's going to happen and you just work with it. So I'm getting that out of the way, smoothing it out. That's the lovely part about quilting is even if your project is kind of baggy or you got little puckers, a lot of times the quilting will take care of it. I'm just going right off the project. I'm going to go ahead and just stitch over instead of breaking my threads just for these two lines. And just kind of stitch over until I get that edge lined up with how I want. And then start down the other side. I like to go up one side and down the other. If I keep going the same way, it kind of starts like, you can see your stitches are pulling the fabric that way. Okay, so for my table runner that has the two borders, I am going to do a wavy stitch. On my machine, it's called a serpentine stitch. And when I do this one, I like to spread it out just a little bit more so it's a little bit more elongated. So these are the width and lengths that I typically do on it. So what I am going to do is my very first time down, and I just kind of eye it. So I just start up in this corner and I just follow this long seam all the way down. And then for the next ones going over, I just line up at the edge of my foot and follow it down. With it being that wavy stitch, it's really forgiving. So here, let me show you. Okay, and one more tip I wanted to make sure to talk about when you are starting to quilt on your sewing machine, make sure you start off with as full of a bobbin as possible because it really bothers me if I'm stitching down and all of a sudden I run out of thread there and then you got to try to lock it in and blech. So always check to make sure that you start off with the full bobbin and check it every once in a while as you go along. So on this wavy stitch. So again, I'm just starting off off of the fabric, smoothing out as best as I can. And then I just start stitching and I kind of sit back from my machine and I just kind of eye it. This gap in my foot here, I'm just trying to go along this center seam for the very first row. You can see it's just kind of going back and forth. And just like with the straight line stitching, I am taking my hands and just kind of smoothing it out as I go. And then I'm coming close to a pin, so I want to make sure to get that out of there. Continue on. What I like to do is use the edge of my foot here and just kind of as I'm stitching down, go along these peaks here as my indicator. This stitch is really forgiving. You can see how I'm just letting the edge of my foot just barely touch that as I'm going down. Going down the same way about three or four times and then I will flip the whole runner over and then go the other way three or four times on either side of this so it doesn't give the look of pulling the fabric. Okay, so now I've gone down here three times. So instead of going all the way back up and coming back down the same way, I'm going to turn this runner around and then go back this way three times 
and this way three times. Okay, I want to show you up close on how to put binding on when you're dealing with an angle like this that isn't a 45 degree angle. Whether you attach your binding to the front or the back, I attach mine to the back first. So what I want to do is I am going to stitch down until I am a quarter inch away from this edge, not up here but this side over here. Put my pin here about a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna stitch down. Once I get a quarter of an inch away from that outside corner, then I'll back stitch. Cut my thread. What I'm gonna do is I am bending this fabric up so that it looks like it's an extension of this going all the way up. I am Pressing to make a, a crease here, and then I will bend it back down. So I just put my finger up there. You could use like a stylus or something like that to go like this to hold this down if you like. I just kind of put my finger underneath there and hold it. So after I went up, I'm just putting my finger there at that point. And then I'm coming straight down. So I'm lining the edge of the fabric up with the edge of the quilt. I start on the fabric itself. I don't go to the edge. I start on the fabric itself. Take a few stitches. And then I back stitch till I either get past the other seam or go off the fabric and then go on forward. So this is what it looks like on the front side. So you can see how it looks like that. So if I was to go ahead and sew this down, when I'd be stitching, I'm coming this way down. Hold that down there. And here you can see this is just a preliminary but you could see how it's going to give me a beautiful miter corner on the front I hope you have enjoyed my triangle table toppers tutorial. Thanks for watching everyone. Have a great day.